Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, where we create light bulb moments for our listeners by exposing the journeys, secrets, and insights of some of the top players in accounting. This podcast is brought to you by Michael Edelstein, Director and Founder of Recruitment Expert, a specialist accounting recruitment agency working across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. Ladies, gentlemen, and accountants, I had the immense pleasure of speaking to Peter Layla, the founder of Blue Rock, which is making waves in the accounting industry with its high-tech and multidisciplinary approach to servicing clients. And it's growing in leaps and bounds. Now, Peter is a true entrepreneur. Besides having grown his firm from $2.8 to $40 million in under seven years, he's also built a whole bunch of hospitality and restaurant businesses alongside that. And today, he shares his humongous vision called Blue Rock 3030, where it's 30 firms around the world doing at least $30 million in fees, all whilst giving his staff the opportunity to share in all their wealth. This episode is not one you want to miss, so enjoy. Hi, Peter. Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, and thank you so much for joining us today. Absolute pleasure, Michael. Nice to be here, and thank you for having me. Well, I'll start by saying I absolutely love what you've done with Blue Rock, like the structure, the model, the branding, A, because it's a great idea and really well executed, and B, because it resonates so much with my own thinking. Um, And I had a look at the website. Look, A, phenomenal and uh, very trippy. But um, I actually recommend to all of our listeners to check it out. And, you know, it's it's, it's out of the world. Thank you. you. Literally, there's a lot of things floating around. Was that built in-house? Uh, it was. So the iteration of the website was sort of a, a brand extension of Blue Rock. And one of the things that I was always very clear about is you have to differentiate yourself in the market super clearly. So when I first started Blue Rock, the website was like any other person's website. And if, if people are interested in like checking out that website, you can use something called the Wayback Machine yep. uh, .org and you can check out the old iterations of the website. And then as the journey progressed, um, I realized that I had more you know, creative free to actually create something pretty unique. So I did uh, create that website in-house with a fellow called Asher, who still works at Blue Rock as our head of design. Um, and I also got some help from a company called Ignite, which was a, a web developer uh, outside that helped me with the, you know, the creative and how it all came together. So yeah, it's a, it's a good expression of who we are. Well, I was going to ask, like with someone, someone with so much passion and creativity, like yourself, how did you end up in accounting? Uh, well, yeah, like it's a pretty common story um, in, in a lot of respects. You finish high school, you have a, a propensity to be good with numbers. And so you do a, an accounting or commerce degree, which I did. Um, and then it was more of a, um, a a guide rail from my dad who who was or still is really important in my life to say, go and do accounting or law uh, because they were the – the professions that he thought would help me in later life. And so um, I started at Coopers and Lybrand back in the day and then uh, went to Grant Thornton uh, where I was eight years working as a tax accountant. So it was sort of um, more by just falling into it than anything. Uh, Obviously, once you get into the world of business and you see how business owners operate and the things they do, you develop an interest in it. And that was sort of what happened with me in my sort of mid to late 20s. I realized I loved helping people who were running their own businesses and then decided that I'd set off on my own course to to do that for them in a very specific way, which is, you know, why Blue Rock exists. Was there a particular point in time where you decided, yep, I'm definitely going to, you know, be a partner and go out on my own? Uh, look, it was never about being a partner. And um, one of the things that I'm super clear on in life is that the, the constructs that we have around how professional services firms work can be pretty contrived and pretty, con, you know, controlling. For me, it was about um, getting out into the world and doing things a way that was very different to everyone else that I thought would resonate with both the, the client community, but also the people who want to work in that community. And mm-hmm. today, Blue Rock's over 200 people and is ev- it's sort of evidence that that thinking is right. So um, I really push back on the old school equity partner models. Um, I think they're pretty broken. Um, and I'm not saying that in a, you know, in a critical way. I'm just saying that because I, I just don't think they work. Um, it's evidenced by the growth of most accounting law finance companies. Um, they don't really grow. Um, they get to a point where the partners are comfortable. 
and they're making lots of money at the expense of everyone else. So that was is that the issue with it, or is that something else? No, that, like... that's the major issue. It's the business model itself. So that the business model that has been created over hundreds of years for professional services has basically inhibited those firms' ability to grow. But then if you look at the, some of the places that you started at, like your Coopers and Library, which is PwC, your, all the big four, some of the top tens, you know, they, they, they grew based on that model. Though. Yeah, but you've got to remember that the big four accounting firms really only work in a very, very narrow segment of the market. So they work in public listed company world, predominantly in government. Yep. And those organisations, by virtue of their governance structures, need, you know, very large organizations looking after them so i would argue whether this is a fair argument or not that if um, those huge organizations didn't exist the big four wouldn't exist either mm. um, they're sort of set up to deal with billion dollar companies and you know department of education department of health which are billion yeah. dollar machines basically and a big audit segment as well correct as a, as a backbone yeah so what, what is a model that you're a proponent of that as an alternative to the equity or yeah, the typical equity a, model then? Good question. Um, so about seven years ago, I set up a company that sits over the top of Blue Rock called Everything is Awesome, uh, EIA as it's more commonly referred to. And the belief system that I've tried to instill in having a structure like that is that separation between the professional services firm and the equity structures that support it. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you allow any person in the organization to invest in the in the capital structure of the business so in order in order to do that though you've got to grow um and so one of the core tenets of my belief system is growth brings opportunity and not not in a financial sense just in a, in the sense that it gives people the opportunity to do more and varied things yep so eaa effectively acts as that vehicle that allows our community to grow pretty quickly um and and you know that's sort of what we're now famous for is our growth trajectory. Can you tell us a little bit more about EIA and how that structure and how that works? Sure. So, well, actually, just to backtrack so we get like yeah. the full history. When you started, um, and I guess you, you walked away from GT, there was uh, another firm, you know, Lettons, we talked about before, yeah. you were there for a short period of time as a director, and then you went out on your own with, I think, five or yeah, about that, eight five, people. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, was that a typical equity structure that you kind of start? Is just the Blue Rock start off in the traditional? Yeah, so Grant, you... Grant Rolston and I owned uh, fifty percent of the practice each when we first started, and yeah. it was traditional in the sense that um, that that's how most businesses start. Hmm. We quickly realised that in order to sort of affect the change that we wanted to, that structure wasn't going to work, and a couple of sort of aspects to that when you've got senior people coming through there's this push and pull between giving them equity or buying equity or selling them equity and you're trying to maintain your position in that company. So um, it wasn't until seven years later that EAA was actually set up. And the, the, the only reason that structure works is because EAA has a mandate to invest in other opportunities that, you know, that exist in the market. And so theoretically, Blue Rock's one of those businesses but yep. there's a heap of other stuff that we've either started ourselves or invested in that sort of supports that holistic value creation, but also that alignment around how you behave within a community uh, across multiple streams. Um, and these days, the businesses that EAA has invested in would employ over a thousand people. So um, there's lots of varied opportunities within the community. If for whatever reason you decide one day you don't want to be an accountant anymore, there's probably another role in the community that you can sort of step into. Uh, mm. that'll scratch that itch, so to speak. Kind of creating like a general electric uh, model? Yeah, well, it's, there's, heaps of, um, there's heaps of examples of sort of industrialised companies that invest in, in lots of different things. GE is a very famous one. The Japanese are also very good at it. Like the, if you think about the big Japanese. The cross-family groups, yep. Yeah, correct. Um, was, there an inspira but, was that the inspiration behind it? Like, because obviously, uh, no. as you said, you started off at, yeah, yeah. in a traditional manner. Honestly, Mike, well, the inspiration behind it is it's you sort of fall and it fall into a lot of things by by um, doing it, and then you work out later yeah. that, that you've actually got to create a reason why you're doing it. Uh, so sometimes your why can come after you've actually done it. Um, I'm a I'm a voracious um, 
creator. So I, I'm always looking to create new opportunities and build new things. And the EIA journey, the Blue Rock journey, as a good example, has evolved as other things have happened. So the, the multidisciplinary yeah. aspect of Blue Rock, um, I sort of fell into that out of frustration because I didn't feel like my clients were being serviced properly by other firms. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't their fault. It was more a function of they weren't their clients in the first place to look after. So we set up... Talking about like your cross-referral partners, like your financial planner. Yeah, so well, back in the day, we, we used to refer our financial planning to a firm, our legal work to a firm, yep. our, all that stuff to a firm. And, and typically speaking, the process would take far too long and um, I felt my clients probably overpaid for it and didn't get what they needed out of that relationship. So out of a need, I brought it in-house and then... What was the first thing you brought in house, by the way? Uh, it was Blue Rock Law. Law, okay. Yeah. Why, why did you start off with law? Uh, well, I, I think that the legal aspect of clients' relationships is the most complex part of everything professional services firms do and the most risky. So mm. I wanted oversight uh, on you know, what was happening with my clients. And what, how long into the journey was that? It's a good question. Um, We've done a few iterations of law because the law firm got sold under an old model when we first started, which I changed so that it couldn't happen again. But that would have been uh, 2010, I reckon, maybe two years into the journey. Oh, wow. Okay. So explain how that happened. You said, did you buy or acquire a law firm? No, no. So I had a really good friend, George Harris, who joined Blue Rock and um, he and I ran a very successful accounting and law practice together. Uh, along the journey, George recognised that he he probably wasn't cut out for running a small law practice, so he sold his practice to a larger law firm called McPherson and Kelly. Okay. Um, and that experience, then there was no ill feelings or or um, bad blood, but that experience showed me that our equity model had to be such that there had to be a holder that sat above the firm that owned most of the equity, and then we gave a, min- a, a minority position of the equity away to the people who are running it. And that way, you, you you won't ever have a situation where you have a firm sold from out under you. Is that because it was under the branding, but not actually like cross? Yeah, equity correct. Ratio? Yeah, George owned one hundred percent of the equity with Alex, who was his okay. business partner. Gotcha. So you didn't bring it in house completely. It was more just. Oh you know, no, we, we were sitting in the same office, and no, but so, yeah, it like, was called Blue Rock, and and you wouldn't have known if you're a client, you would have looked at yeah. on the same firm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no. That was just one of the a good example of a of a situation where you don't realise the consequences until after the fact. Yeah. And then you adapt your model accordingly. And then what was the next did you start basically seeking out another law? No. Oh, so yeah, or? well one of one of my very um, good mates, Dan Holdsworth, um, at the time that that was all happening was was looking for his next opportunity. So he came in and set up Blue Rock Partners as it became known um, in the second iteration. And that business still exists today. So that would have been 2014. That was the same time we started Blue Rock Wealth, Blue Rock Finance. Uh, I think I started Blue Rock Digital about a year or six months before all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we've now built an ecosystem within the firm where all of the clients' needs can be looked after in-house. Yeah. How many divisions have you got now? Because it sounds like, I think you told me 10. Yeah, I don't know. 10 services. I've no idea is the short short answer. The, the way that I'm trying to <laughs> reposition the thinking on what I think all professional services firms should be thinking about is don't think about it as service lines. Think about it as customer service needs. So mm-hmm. if a client has a need for a will, have that capability. If the client has a need for a shelter's agreement, have that capability. If they need commercial um, property finance, have that capability. Yep. Uh, and break down the need to have a service line. What what will happen in the future? And I know a lot of people will be out there listening to this going, I've heard it all before, but I can promise you it's coming. All of the all the work we do will be automated. And uh, mm-hmm. there's a it's like we're just at the moment we're just pouring uh, petrol on the on the dry stack of wood and when someone strikes that match, it'll uh, it'll be a different kettle of fish for a lot of firms who are in market. You're talking about the typical compliance work? Oh, I'm talking about everything. Like we, we, we started a business called Propeller.io, which is a, a big data prop tech business about three years ago, and I hired mm-hmm. uh, eight mathematicians, a couple of 
uh, full stack tech developers, uh, a guy who worked at Transurban as EMD, and we have built technology in that business, cost us millions of dollars in fairness, that can fully automate how we analyze a property using big data and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing at the moment is most accounting firms, law firms make too much money doing it the old way, so there's no incentive to invest. Yep. It'll be the new, the new breed coming through and they'll build stuff like Zero did with uh, General Ledgers that will um, that will completely change the game. Okay. And look, and just to give people a bit of perspective, um, when you came out and started Blue Rock in 2008, that was well, a, on the cusp of GFC. And how big was that business in terms of fees? Uh, well, when I left... The first year. Yeah, when I left Latins, some clients obviously followed me. So I had some relationships there, but... You know, starting from a zero base, um, I don't actually know what the revenue was, but I reckon we probably would have done eight hundred thousand dollars or something. Yeah, with five to eight staff, and then I think the point where you started to diversify, I think you said around two point eight. Uh, so two thousand and fourteen. Yeah. Uh, was two point eight mil. We were doing just under two point eight million, two point seven five. Yeah, so you grew from say eight hundred to two point eight six years, and then. Fast forward another six, seven years, we're now at around 40 mil, basically. Yeah, correct. And and predominant, just so everyone understands the story, most of it's organic. We bought a little firm when I moved premises uh, to bolster our revenue, which is about 900,000. And then we grew from that 2.8 to about 30-ish, uh, all organic. Mm. And then recently, we've started to acquire some more opportunities to help bolster our technical capability. And the, a, a big chunk of it is obviously accounting, the foundation for it. Yeah, about a third of it, I guess, would be accounting. Yeah. So, it, it, and then look, the reason I wanted to kind of highlight that is to show the model does work. Um, yeah. And, but it has been very well executed. Well, well. It's, a, it's, a hard, it's a hard there. model. Most professionals who are, have been in this business for a long time will say it's very hard to actually work with accountants. It's very hard to work with financial planners. It's very hard to work with lawyers. And... <laughs> um, that's because people typically like to do things their own way. Um, what we've tried to build at Blue Rock, rightly or wrongly, is a, a, a customer-centric service offering that puts the customer first and then fills in all the pieces around that customer to make sure that they feel like they're being well-protected, well-looked after. And, and we, we try to be agnostic in terms of service lines because it's a dangerous thing when you start saying, like you talk to a lot of accountants and they say, I hate financial planners. And you talk to a lot of financial players and they say, oh, I hate accountants. And that's a very strong word, right? Hate. Mm. Um, I'm agnostic to to what people do. What I'm more interested in is working out are the people that I'm working with good people. Yeah. And do I care about them? And if I can solve that sort of equation, it um, I reckon it just makes life better. And easier. Yeah, well, always easier. You're always going to have your thoughts. <laughs> but uh, life's easier when you, when you care about the people you work with. Is that your biggest thing that you look for? Or is that your kind of internal test when you're interviewing someone? 100%. Yep. Yeah. So if I had a choice, I'd work with all of my best mates, my close friends, my family, um, the people that I love the most in the world are the ones that I want to spend time with. And the really simple equations for me is, is so obvious that it's it, it pains me that people don't see this, is we spend hours and hours and hours doing what we love at work. Hmm. And if we're not working with people who we genuinely care about, then you've, you're basically taking most of your productive working life or living life and working with people you don't care about. And it's like, it just, it feels like such a foreign concept to me that you'd make that choice. So if you've got, I don't know, call it 80 hours a week of, or 100 hours a week of waking time to do stuff and you're, you're spending a half of a half of that time working with people you don't like or doing something you don't like, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm pretty clear and passionate about that belief system that get as many people around us that we love being around and do stuff we love yeah. doing with them and the rest will sort of work itself out. <laughs> How has uh, COVID had an impact on that? Just I guess you're based in Melbourne with the whole lockdown thing. You're not a longer, you know, you're yep. in your own little cocoon at home. So is everyone yep. else. So when uh, yeah. COVID started for Blue Rock, and I've got a, a few stories about the businesses that I've invested in through EIA, but when COVID started uh, in March of 2020, I basically called all the directors of the firm in. There would have been probably 
30 odd directors mm. and uh and said so we've got some pretty challenging times ahead and we all dropped down to four days of pay and worked five days a week and we sort of pulled a whole lot of people in the organization that we thought wouldn't be productive and we stood them down under the job keeper provisions um one of those people was a woman named joe stanlake who was one of the directors in our digital marketing team and we made her the um the Blue Rock Sales and Marketing Director, so for the firm, something that I've been thinking about but hadn't executed on. Mm -hmm. And then we implemented HubSpot as a CRM and we really tightened up how we communicated with our community around everything that was happening. Um, and fair to say April, May and June was a disaster and would have been a disaster for a lot of firms in terms of just doing a lot of work for free to support clients and make sure that they are okay. Uh, yeah. But from... From 1 July till today, we've put 60 staff on over COVID and our revenues have grown, I don't know, probably put five or six million dollars of new revenue on over that period, um, which which is, is a testament to how well we looked after our clients that were in trouble and then a testament to how well we communi communicated to the market that we're experts in crisis management. Um, in terms of the, the work load at the moment we've got so much work coming through the doors that we can't keep up with it i'm like we're putting on three or four people a week at the moment wow is that across all divisions or is that a particular is there a particular uh, across, division that's growing the fastest uh, they're all the same we're, we're getting hammered and, and i think a lot of people will say this like i'm i'm not alone we're not unique a lot of businesses have done well out of covid mm. and, that, and i reckon the delta is the people that really care about their communities have done really well yep. and the people that have sort of run and hidden have stayed you know, their, their feet are planted on the ground and they've stayed pretty static through all this. It's, are you saying it's a lot of clients that are basically moving across from firms that didn't look after them? Oh, 100%. During... 100% yeah. Definitely. There's definitely okay. that. And there's so much money on the table in terms of support for business owners from the government. And we're, we are dynamite at communicating that through to people. They're probably sick of us telling them that there's another grant and that we're going to apply for you and... Um, a lot, a lot of firms, and it's, it's a tough situation, just don't have the resources to actually deal with what's happening. Yeah. Uh, we were really lucky. Like a lot of people think success comes from hard work. A lot of success comes from being in the right place at the right time and having the right thing to deal with whatever's happening. And we were primed for it. So we probably had, I don't know, 150 odd people at that point and we were ready to go. Okay. Is it just, are you saying basically you had the capacity and you... Oh, uh, the capacity, but also the technology to support how you actually execute it. So we've invested heavily in technological solutions to automate how we do what we do. Yep. Um, and that, are they in-house solutions or are they off-the-shelf solutions? It's a mix. Um, mm -hmm. So a good example is our estate planning tool that uh, we can interview our clients using our estate planning tool and it automatically generates the documents which we developed in-house. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, um, we use tools like Asana heavily, um, Sign Now heavily. Um, yeah, that's you just sort of pick the best thing to solve the right problem. What What are the biggest? Well, I, I guess because most of the audience will be accounting firm base. What are the biggest tools or the ones with the biggest impact that you that you use or have implemented? Um, Asana would be number one. So every single yep. client we run has an Asana board. Uh, My Prosperity, which is a tool that helps um, track a client's financial position. Xero mm -hmm. uh, is an amazing tool and we have a lot of plugins that go into Xero that help support reporting infrastructure but also help uh, manage um, how things get done. Do you and Xero practice manager as well? or We actually use APS. APS, okay. That's a and legacy. It on. That's a legacy system from when I started Blue Rock. I sort of went for the best in market at the time. Yep. And uh, I really like APS, but unfortunately, it, it the the technology, in my view, and whether this is fair or not, hasn't kept up with what's happening in the market. So, um, part of our strategy to expand Blue Rock is um, Blue Rock thirty thirty, and as we set up new offices, we'll. Um, We'll probably go with XPM, which is the Zero Practice Manager. Do you find it will work for a firm of your scale? Because I've, yeah, I've... Right at the moment, we've been told XPM's we're too big for that. 
that's what I've heard from my clients as well. They say it's good for like a mid-size, you know, small to mid-size firm, but yeah. any bigger yeah. than that, they struggle. Yeah. So we, we, I'll, I'll talk about 3030 in a, in, a, in a minute. But the other thing we do is we use um, a corporate services provider called CCASA, which uh, we, is a managed service solution for all of our corporate secretarial. So that also which, helps. Which is under the EIA umbrella, isn't it? It's something, yeah, where there's a tie into EIA in terms of how we help them as a client managing their business. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just back to that structure. So you've got EIA, it owns Blue Rock, um, and, as well as all the other investments. And then all the directors have a, a holding in EIA? Or like, buy it, to EIA? Everyone in the community. So um, we've invested in, in lots of different businesses and we have an open mandate for people who work in any of those businesses to invest. So... It's not EIA is not a, a Blue Rock centric thing. Like it's a it's, it's a it's an advisory business that supports in an active way the businesses that it's invested in, and we let any of the employees in those businesses invest in EIA. And outsiders as well, or just employees? absolutely no, no, absolutely anyone and can owns, invest. And Blue Rock is one hundred percent owned by EIA. No, Blue Rock is a is an investment of EIA. Yeah, uh, but none of the businesses are owned one hundred percent by EIA. It's always a, a an equity position that aligns. Okay. And, and then EIA helps with the strategy and advisory piece around how they grow and you know be successful. So there's still an equity stake that you have, and some of the directors have in Blue Rock. Itself. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was just going back to, like, what would be the takeaway for anyone setting up or growing? their existing accounting firm in terms of what you say, like the, the old model is broken. Then what, I'm trying to figure out what, what is the the model that works then based on your philosophy? Sure. Well, the, the, there are four central pillars of any, um, any strategy around growth. And the first one is brand. So if there's accounting firms out there that want to grow, the best advice I can give them is think about your brand. Think about mm -hmm. who you are and what you want to represent in the market and how you do that. The second piece is um, your people strategy. So you've got to think about how do you get, um, sort of sounds a bit cliche, but how do you get the right people working on the right things? Yep. And one of the key things that I have in every business I run is an operations manager or a chief operating officer, depending on the title mm -hmm. you want to put on them. But they basically make all the stuff happen that makes the business run well. Um, the third piece is the business model. So... Um, what's the business model? A lot of accountants will have had that discussion about value billing and hourly billing and all that. I mean, I sort of think of it as nonsense, right? I, I don't necessarily plug into any of that conversation because the way that I think about every business that I advise in my own businesses is what's the business model that m makes the most sense for the customer? And that can mm -hmm. be different, right? You can have one customer that says, Pete, I'm really happy just to pay a monthly fee and that's cool. The other one yeah. might say, I really want to see how many hours you put on the clock. I'm having to pay you for, for an hour of your time. <laughs> but you've got to work out what works for you. But also have a think about what things you can provide to your customer that adds value that can become part of the DNA of um, how you actually look after them. And, that, and I've got a few revenue centres in Blue Rock that have been built that are really good for our customers but also good for Blue Rock. And then the final pillar in terms of growth is technology. And there's two ways you can look at technology. One is a process strategy where you implement things that streamline process. Mm -hmm. And another one is a product strategy where you implement technology that automates product. I'm a product guy. So I believe that we should have tools that automate how you prepare a bass. And if you charge 350 bucks a quarter for your bass, you should have a process around a product, how you automate that process is it what's in between sorry you said product and process i'm still trying to figure out um what's the difference in like what, what does it mean to automate a product versus yeah, automating good. a process so if you think about any any business doesn't matter what sort of business it is typically they sell a product yep and that product in accounting world is tax planning year-end financials tax returns mm -hmm. basses payroll tax reconciliations all the stuff that we do they're products. So if you think about them like products, then you can build a solution that actually automates how you deliver that product to your customer. Mm -hmm. When you think about process, they're, they're how do you do things that make 
the job of the people working in the organization more linear. So we run the Microsoft stack at, stack at Blue Rock. And when I log on to my PC at home, I've got a laptop and I've got a PC at work. It's the same experience across all three platforms. How we save documents is um, through a product called SharePoint. How we do our uh, analytics is through a product called Power BI. Um, mm-hmm. That's process technology engineering. Gotcha. So a lot of, in fact, most people will focus on the process technology solution. And mm-hmm. I would encourage you to think about the product solution. Okay. So you started talking about the BAS as an example. Can you follow that through? Sure. So... Um, oh, I don't want to talk about tax planning because I reckon that's something that accounts will understand a lot more in terms of the process. So every year, um, every accountant in Australia has to prepare trust distribution minutes before year end as part of the statutory requirements with the uh, Australian government. Mm-hmm. The way we do that is we get nine months of results out of zero and then we estimate three months of results out of zero that um, that will give you 12 months of profit and loss. We then do a tax reconciliation uh, we then pay a dividend out to a trust and then the trust distributes that profit out to the owners and we prepare a trust minute. And yep. typically speaking, an accountant would charge between $1,500 and $2,500 per client yep. that has a, a tax money need. And that would take a junior accountant probably five to 10 hours to repair and maybe the partner or the manager an hour to review. Mm-hmm. Then you'd have a meeting with the client. What I'm advocating is a world where a, a piece of technology interrogates zero, takes nine months of results, takes three months of forecast, because one of the products in Blue Rock is our financial forecast tool that we use for every client to forecast their results for the next 12 months. The, the, the application would interrogate zero and, and estimate the profit for the year using um, some algorithms. It would then automatically prepare a tax reconciliation. It would automatically pay a dividend out of the company and prepare trust distribution minutes. Now, this is all done by machine, right? Yeah. No humans. At the end of that process, the manager would get the file and they would review exactly what they would review as a human prepared and they would make changes accordingly. Now, I believe that that product can still be sold for probably $1,500, but would be prepared by the accountant within you know, within an hour. Um, and that's the augmentation of a professional services using technology. Are there going to be any junior accountants left after that? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, in 10 years from now, Michael, uh, the world is going to be pretty dramatically changed. What sort of changes do you foresee, I guess, A, in the world, but B, in the accounting industry? Uh, look, I'm, it'll, it's broken record stuff, right? Because mm-hmm. um, we've been talking about this for since I've been an accountant. That's what I'm saying. It's hard to. It's hard to. Well, it's not. It's not really. Like, if you out. think about, I mean, if you think about how accounting firms do year end compliance, we we do a balance sheet reconciliation every year, and mm. then we do a tax reconciliation, and then we repair our tax return, right? And um, we still do it the same way that we did it when I was at Grant Thornton fifteen yep. years ago, and. Like there's stuff out there already that can do all that stuff without you being involved. Just accountants haven't invested the time to understand how they can make that happen without actually going through the process. So for me, it's about picking the best of, of the products that are out there and automating those processes from start to finish. And then instead of charging four or five grand for a year, and I'll charge $1,000 and it won't actually be how I make money as a professional advisor it'll be it, that'll be the strategy of how we help business owners make more money and that's sort of why we're growing so quickly is because we offer things to the market that other people can't offer them yeah okay what would i guess what would the advice be to a smaller accounting firm that doesn't have millions to invest into their own well i, I was like that um the best advice i can give you is have a clear vision so i had my 2020 vision which was to get to 20 million by 2020 back in the day yeah um, if anyone is interested in having a look at that, um, if you Google my name and Blue Rock on Prezi, which is a presentation. I looked at it. Brilliant presentation. Yeah. I look, I, and I just sort of evolved as the journey's gone on, but that was me just sort of putting my ideas down on paper as to how we were going to get there. And now that we've got through 2020, I'm now working on 3030, which is getting 30 Blue Rock offices around the world, each doing 30 million in revenue. Following a similar model. 
uh, it's yeah. uh, the model's quite different to the 2020 model, but yes, follow it. There's a strategy around how I'm actually going to execute on that vision, which is about finding young um, firms that have an appetite to want to grow and do more venture type work and mm -hmm. partnering with them and teaching them how to grow their businesses from that small space into a very large space as part of our sort of community. By using the whole multidisciplinary approach. Correct. And the tech and the technology that I'm developing in the background to support that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. I just wanted to go back to some of the four pillars that you kind of discussed brand people, uh, the business model and tech, the brand, I guess differentiation is, uh, is what you mentioned before is a big aspect of, of branding basically. Yeah. Um, which a lot of people would struggle with in accounting because accounting is accounting, but it, it's doable as you've done it. Yeah. Um, what, what the, 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 the advice there, Michael, I think is think about specialized, specialized advice versus generalist advice. So your brand should reflect whether you're a deep specialist in a really, you know, a, 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 a long vertical or whether you're a generalist like we are at Blue Rock. Hmm. Um, obviously specialists can charge more money, have a much deeper understanding of the topic that they're experts in, but also have a smaller market to attack. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's, and there's nothing wrong with it. Cause like, I know there's a lot of proponents going, yep, oh, you should niche, but 100%, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah no, agree. Generalist. agree completely. Um, the part that I'm interested in is blue. Well, in blue rock, you've grown significantly. Now it's a professional services model. You can only leverage via people and technology. Um, tell me a bit more about the, the people strategy. Like how did you go or how do you go about getting the right people on board? Yeah. Well, you've got to try and work out what it is they want. Um, you haven't seen our offices, Michael, but our offices are people. I've seen photos. Okay. I, I, as, I, I nearly put in an application. They describe them as Google S. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that's the unicorns and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's really I think, cool. I think people like that idea of having fun and, um, they're quite keen to be involved in a business that sort of represents that fun. So I was pretty clear that I wanted to build a really fun office. Um, I yep. wanted to do lots of fun things in that office and use some of the money that we had from what we did professionally to help our people have fun and have a good time. Um, so for me, finding the people's never been an issue because we have a really strong belief system around looking after each other and, and living a life where you work with people you care about. So combined with the, the, you know, the website, first look in, the office, second look in, meeting the people who generally are genuinely good people who look after each other, it sort of flows naturally that we attract lots of people that are aspirationally looking for something different. Yep. Um, and... I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wear jeans and T-shirts in the office most days, even when I'm meeting clients. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first started, I used to get suits made for me. And uh, it's changed a lot over the journey, but I actually don't think people really care about how you dress. Uh, I think they care more about the quality of your character and the advice that you can provide them with and the help you can give them. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, and uh, I guess that aspect has definitely changed a lot um across the board you know even in the big four now um but how do you okay say you've got 10 people applying because they love the website they love the office and then we'll, we'll start off with that aspect how will you go about determining which of those 10 is right for blue rock and sure. you actually want to hire them first thing we do is we run a we run a what's a nice way to say this we run an aptitude test mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't score a certain number on that aptitude test you don't go any further what what does the aptitude test look like uh i won't i won't say um people can okay. people can work it out for themselves um that they'll it may apply for a job at blue rock and you'll work it out pretty quickly <laughs> is um, it like your own stuff is it something that you develop yourself or nah, it's something that I, that, that's in america that i've i've, I've learned about at grant thornton actually because uh, okay. they did a similar thing when i was there i'm not sure if they still do um, yeah, a lot of the like the RSMs and Grand Fortnites, they still do the aptitude thing. Like, yeah, they use like either SHL platforms or a few other ones. Yeah, um, um, there's heaps, there's heaps out there. There's heaps, yeah. Some and it's kind of like semi IQ, semi personality, depending on how much. Uh, oh, this is pure IQ. Pure IQ. Okay. Yeah, pure IQ. So that's yeah. important to you. The you know, intelligence. The, the, the intelligence part is important to you. Okay. Well, we deal with seriously complex things, right? And mm. uh, easy to make mistake so you want to make sure that you've got an aptitude to deal with that complexity yep um and then it's it's 
like any other interview process, we, we probably talk more about the situational aspects of that person's life. So I'm more interested in what did your parents do? How many brothers and sisters do you have? Um, what do you do? What's important to you around exercise? Um, try and get a sense of them as individuals. Um, yep. And you, you always, it's almost like choosing your friends. I don't know. Like it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Um, I sort of reckon that everyone can be trained for the technical aspects of the work we do. Mm. So that's not as important to me. Okay. Uh, and and, so, and the, a good piece of advice for the accountants living out there is invest in lots and lots of grads. Okay. Like the is that, was that your strategy? Yeah, I still is. Because you obviously have a lot of leadership, like your, your leadership uh, tier is quite heavily boosted or has been boosted over the last couple of years. Yeah. It's a big chunk of the team. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've just gotten bigger. So we've needed more people to manage that work. But we hire, I don't know. I don't know what the average demographic would be in terms of age profile. We hire a lot of young graduates. Okay. And the key thing is aptitude. And then in terms of the, I guess, how do you determine is it the right person? Like, call you've asked them, do, do you look for a particular trait, like with a particular background? Uh, you asked them about... no, no, not really. No. I like, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic to the people as long as they seem like good people and they're smart. Okay. And we train so them up. That... Okay. Is there a telltale sign, like a particular. I wouldn't say uh, there's magic tell. questions that you are you look uh, for. I love. I mean, I love asking. I, I, I hired a young fellow recently in in EIA, and I asked him a question about hey how he'd fill the meeting room up with basketballs, mm-hmm. and uh, I said to him if you can get, if you can give me a good answer via email, I'll give you time to think about it, then I'll give you the job. <laughs> and uh, I wanted a full blown from procurement to uh, freight to execution answer including volumetrics of how many basketballs would fit in that room once he took the measurements before he left. Um, Because they're the sorts of problems I have to solve for my customers. Not, they're not actually interested in tax returns. Anyone can do those. Mm. They want to, they want to, they want people that can answer hard questions that come from nowhere, basically. Okay. And is that a typical thing or is that a. Yeah, pretty typical with, with me anyway. I mean, I I, I love asking, (laughs) you know, sort of outside the box questions just to see how people deal with it but at least you gave him a chance to do it by email not put him I, on the spot like the i gave him two chances because the first time he failed i thought he was good and i wanted to hire him yeah um but i also wanted him to understand the problems that i'd be asking him to solve so he he sent one response through the fellow that interviewed me with him and i sent it back and said you're not going to get hired based on this try again and he came back with a really good response okay Anything else that you do that's interesting in the hiring process? Uh, well, there's there's always a social aspect. So typically I would try and get people involved socially to see how they deal with social situations. Yeah. Um, and we have a really clear belief around hiring people that we know. So if you asked, if you did a straw poll of our Blue Rockers, you'd find something like 80% of them have come from other people who already work in the business. Okay. Um, so the, the, that's a big aspect, the referral, the in-house referral. Yeah, it's process. huge. Because okay. if, if your friends are my friends type stuff. Yeah. And um, what's the retention been like? Uh, look, it's it's a really tricky one um, because the question is what's the, what's the retention been like for people that we didn't want to lose? Because mm-hmm. like any organization, we have people that haven't worked out for one reason or another. Um, and... I've often thought this would be a good thing to do is actually go back and interview every single person that's left Blue Rock to understand what they would say about the organisation. Yep. Um, but I think we run at maybe 15% uh, attrition, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and is it more at the junior level or the senior level? It's all over the place. Like the senior people have been with us. Like the guys that started Blue Rock with me are all still there. Yep. Um, Rosie, who was my PA... Um, she worked with me for 10 years. Um, she's still there. She's got into an operations role. Kate, who um, worked it with me at Grand Thought, and she's still there. She's been with me for 20 years. Um, so there's there's a lot of goodwill in terms of their attention, but like all organisations, as you get bigger, you lose people, and occasionally yeah. you lose people you don't want to lose. How do you iterate that for that? Like, you know, do you, have you changed the, the hiring process or anything inside the company to improve either 
you know the, the attraction or retention of the yeah children. it's not a problem so we, we don't have a retention problem per se um but you, you could say if you lose anyone who you didn't want to lose you have a retention problem but that's something that's just <laughs> yeah. human nature in some respects so would you say most people that leave are kind of the ones you wanted to leave anyway uh look it's a it's a real mixed bag michael um, yeah okay i think some people who who leave you you rationalize it you say they were no good anyway but i don't actually think that's true i just mm. think that people have their own lives to live and for whatever reason they're not happy and they move on um, and i try not to get too wound up about it i always um make a point of personally going up to every single person that leaves and i say goodbye personally and i wish them well and if they ever have anything they need help with to reach out we'll always be around yeah uh, even if it's on poor terms um yeah okay because I'd rather I'd rather build a legacy where people feel like they've they've come in well and they've left well. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, you've touched on it before. Like you've got the nice website, the nice office. But what about back in the day when you were still sort of in that one or two million dollar range? You know, your first six years. How did you go about growing it and, and getting the right people on board? Um, was that a similar process you followed, or was that something different? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think if I reflect back on when you were, when I was really small, I obviously had a lot more ability to influence individual outcomes. So I'd spent a lot of time with individual clients. I was never shy asking for a client referral. Yep. Um, I was always good at just sort of making it, people aware that um, this is how we go about doing what we do. I mean, one of the key things that I had from the very start of Blue Rock was a monthly meeting product where we meet okay. with their clients monthly and we go through their business performance in a bit of detail um and that sort of helped demonstrate that we weren't just tax accounts we were, we were advisors and clients came to us pretty readily um and then obviously from a people perspective i empowered people from day one to take more ownership over their relationship so mm -hmm. a lot of accountants fall over because everything funnels back into that partner relationship yep um and that's there's only so many relationships you can manage right um i think i also hired um senior people early so i had lots of um directors without fees which gives you capacity to grow as well okay so and then when did you i guess turn on the grad tap uh, I'd always hired at a drop of a hat young grads. Okay. So I never had a grad program. I don't believe they work. Um, I'd probably get. You don't believe they work. Why is that? <sighs> oh, they don't. Well, because you're, you're basically stacking the odds against you, right? You, you, you're going to market at the same time that every other firm's going to market. Mm -hmm. You're putting yourself out there as this firm that can recruit, I don't know, 10 or 15 people from a pool of 100. Yep. And you immediately discount all of those people that have fallen through the cracks. So, like, take me, for example. I failed um, accounting 1B in first year, and I failed macroeconomics, I reckon, in third year at Melbourne Uni Commerce. Wow. Did not expect that from you, Pete. No, I did I, not I, on the flip side, I was top of my class <laughs> in high school. But that, that happens. I'm only about to give you. That, that happens, right? I, I, I'm not too stressed about academic results um, but my point really was by failing those two subjects i had to do an extra half a year at melbourne uni yeah and that automatically means you fall out of a lot of you know a lot of uh, the way that those firms recruited um you still got into coopers though well and i still worked at grant thornton for eight years so like yeah <laughs> it's it's irrelevant in in a lot of respects but m more my point is a lot of young people are living their own life doing whatever it is they do. Like I spoke to a, a fellow yesterday who played professional cricket for the Melbourne, for one of the Melbourne cricket teams and he's looking for his first job. And uh, I just had a conversation with him and said, mate, you sound like a really good fella. I'm going to put you in touch with one of the MDs in the division that he wants to work in and he'll probably get a job. Mm. Um, and we, we would do two or three of those a month. Okay. Um, do you have a structure that you follow or are you more of a gut feel recruit? Uh, like we definitely style? do. Yeah, we absolutely have a structure around how we recruit. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not, not something that I'm across because it's not an area that I need to worry about these days, but, um, we, at any point in time, we'd have 15 to 20 job ads out Yeah, okay. right now well, we would as well. 
at what point did you start like dropping the tools and more focused on the being i guess the ceo of the of the business well i'm not the ceo um i wasn't not, not anymore but back like basically the, the strategic visionary no, i i i never I'm, I'm even today not off the tools so i'm a i'm a passionate advisor and i love um sitting with clients and working through solutions to tricky situations mm-hmm. um but i have a, obviously a high capacity to do things quickly so one of the things that I try and do is get the decisions that I make made quickly, even without all available information, so that I can sort of make the best decision quickly without thinking too hard about it, rightly or wrongly. Okay. When you say you've got a high capacity, how did you? Uh, well, actually, one one of the questions I'll ask you is, what do you attribute your success to? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm certainly I, I get very excited by um things so i have a certain passion for helping people whether it's you know whatever it is that they do um and i love i love having a crack like i'm not shy about starting a new business or investing in something or backing someone to do something um i don't know i think i'm pretty good with people like i get along well with people and i try my best to look after them that's probably where the success comes from okay but do you, I don't know, like you talked about, you've got a very high capacity to do things. Is it just like you, you, you work a lot? Like you work a lot harder than other people? Nah, do you... I definitely don't work a lot harder. I work smart. So when I was a young accountant, one of the partners that I worked for told me whether this was right or not, that he thought you could do everything that people did in about four hours a day. Mm-hmm. And uh, that resonated with me because I reckon we waste a lot of time doing things that aren't necessary. So... Um, I just work through things really quickly. Uh, and so I have a high capacity to get through a lot of stuff really quickly. Okay. Um, but how do you go about doing that? I'm very, like good at, I'm very good at working with teams as well. So in any given matter, I'll work with the, the team in EAA. I'll work with my Blue Rock team. Mm-hmm. I'll work with the propeller team. Um, and I'll make sure that um, I'm not – it's not on me to actually do it. So I'll help with the ideas and the strategy and the – iteration of how we actually get to a solution and then i'll say do this 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 and this and away they go and off they do it um that just helps like yeah lots of different things that happening at once yeah and i think that only works if you have as you said like ops manager and uh, people you can delegate to but what about when you starting out and not as big as you are now well you have it's it's really simple you have an ops manager but that person's often also doing reception Hmm. Uh, you have a practice manager, but that person is probably also a senior accountant in your organization. Um, it's about giving opportunity to the people that you work with to actually do more themselves yep. and trusting them to do it. So Ella Clark, who has worked with me her whole life, um, she started out as an accountant, got up to associate director, and then she moved into an operations role, um, CFO role within the organization. Mm. Um, and these days she works alongside me in EIA as the investment manager. Okay. What about, I, I guess, when you were younger, were you one of the most, you know, a GT, were you one of the most efficient, you know, productive people? Uh, I, and... was, I would suggest a GT, if you ask people who I worked with there, they would have said that I was pretty brash and prickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's, you know, that's probably a function of youth. Like you, you get better at, sanding out the rough edges as you get older, I think, and becoming a more balanced person. Um, mm. But I was just, I was hungry back then to, to do more and aggressive in terms of my approach to how I climbed the corporate ladder, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was there from about, I don't know, 23 or 24 till I was about 30, I guess. Yep. Um, what made and, you leave then? Oh, so it's a long story, but... Um, I probably saw the writing on the wall in terms of where I was going to end up in terms of that organization. And and like a lot of partnerships or a lot of professional services businesses, they have a very entrenched management team. Mm -hmm. And that management team has usually has a low propensity to want to relinquish power. Um, And that can be both at a equity level, but also at a management level. So someone like me, I like to be involved in management and help with the management decisions. Yep. Um, and yeah, no, you, you have a few run-ins as a as a senior manager in, in those sorts of organisations, and you make a call to leave effectively. But yeah, I loved I loved Grant Thornton. I loved my time there. It was a awesome place to work, and um, 
I learned so much. Like I was, I was doing tax for eight years, right? So sadly now I'm really good at tax. <laughs> I remember reading somewhere that when you were a GT, um, you decided in order to be able to relate to your clients, you had to run a business as well. And I think you, you started a, a bar. I did. I started a bar called Murmur, uh, which if any of the listeners out there is called Murmur Piano Bar these days. Um, you still was, own it? We, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that was the start of my teach myself how to run a business by owning a business. So okay. teach myself how to advise a business owner by owning a business journey. Did you buy it or did you start it? No, nah, we went in every night after. It was an apartment in the city and I went in every night after work and on the weekends and we tiled and we painted and we went to a kitchen factory in Cheltenham and we built a bar. Um, so this is you and your mates? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and these days that business, um, so it's called the 100 Burgers Group. It owns uh, Welcome to Thornbury, Welcome to Brunswick, Bell's Hot Chicken, Mr Burger. Uh, the Mint, the Prince Albert Hotel, Natural History, Mama Cedar, Hightail. Uh, yeah, like lots and lots of different businesses that I still am the chairman of and uh, one of the larger shareholders. Um, but you've got your friends that are kind of part of that structure and business. Yeah, absolutely. Helped you along the way. Yeah, my, some of my best friends work in that business. Because I was going to say, it's really hard to be a, a manager, senior manager at GT and um, run a, a well, bar. Was, a so one of the rules at GT, interestingly, one of the rules was you had to retire when you were 55. Yep. And one of the rules was if you, you couldn't own any other business interests if you wanted to be a director. Uh, so they okay. were some of the things that I looked at as a person coming through. Not Not sure they would have made me a director anyway, but if they did, I would have had to relinquish my ownership in the pub business, which is... You know, it's it's a bigger business than Blue Rock is. Obviously, COVID has got it brought us down a peg or two, but um, it's a big business in its own right. Um, but I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't reconcile the that sort of trying to control people by saying you have to get out when you're 55, mm. and not being able to own another business like that. That's core to the DNA of how you be a successful entrepreneur. I reckon. So the whole group started just from that murmur piano. It did, yeah. Yeah, a long time wow. ago. It's started that in two, 2004. And 2004, okay. And then how, I guess, what did you learn from that experience? Um, we well, learned lots of stuff. You learn how to curate the customer experience in terms of fit out and experience. So yep. hospitality starts with the customer entering, entering the premise. Mm-hmm. You then learn about how you serve a customer in a way that makes them want to come back how you provide a product that makes them want to um, talk to their friends about how good you are. Are you hands-on pouring drinks and everything? Uh, No, the only hands-on bit that I was was with the strategy of growth acquisition. Uh, I did all the books. Like I'd go in on the weekend. I had, we, we, and I have four, four boys. We had four boys in three years, twins in there. Um, So I'd go in with little Harry in a, you know, in one of those carry baskets and I'd sit in the basement of the mint and I'd do the books um, all day Saturday and most of Sunday. Um, So I was hands-on with the numbers and the cash flows and the strategy, but um, other guys actually poured the drinks. Yeah, okay. How do you balance that, like having multiple children, wife? Same deal. You You just do everything to the best of your ability quickly. Um, but what sort of hours were you working or I, you know, have traditionally worked? I've never, I've never really worked long hours. Like, well, That's a relative thing. A hundred hours might not be long. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, there's no way I work a hundred hours. So um, I, I get up most mornings between six and seven o'clock. Yeah. I'll often go and exercise. Um, like I woke up at six this morning to go for a run. It was absolutely bucketing down and I pulled the pin. I'll go for a run this summer. Um, and then I'm in back-to-back meetings every day. So from about nine o'clock till about three o'clock, four o'clock, I'm in back-to-back meetings for every hour of every day. So yep. call that five days at six hours, that's 30 hours. And then, uh, I'll sit on the couch watching television. Like I love, I, I consume, I consume television. I consume newspapers and I'll read and then I'll check my emails. Or I'll just flick off an email to someone. Um, and I don't consider that working. Like I'll sit, I was watching um, Brooklyn Nine Nine last night, and I'm shooting a few emails off, and I'm reading, you know, about COVID, and I'm happy to look at vaccination rates, and and I go to bed about ten o'clock and do it all again. 
Okay. And that's how you've always structured it, even back in the day? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Always try and exercise most days. Yeah. Uh, try and do something like on the weekends, definitely spend time with the kids. Uh, we love mountain biking, so we're big mountain bikers. Uh, we all run, which is good. Um, so it's, yeah. It's... Do, you, do you work on weekends as well, though? Uh, not really, no. Like, okay. the same sort of deal. I'll get emails and I'll ping back responses, or if there's something super urgent, I might have a think about it while I'm going for a ride or a run or something. But, but do you, when do you switch off then? Like, because otherwise, it's that whole being on, always on kind of yeah. burns a lot of people out over time. Nah, I don't mind it. I'm pretty good being always on. And uh, as I said, I make decisions fast, good or bad. Um, and you have a PA that runs your calendar for you, et cetera. And so Rosie's email. done that for 10 years and she's incredible. And then Daisy has just started with me uh, about two months ago. She's going really well. Um, and before that, Kate was looking after me for seven, eight years but with crossover from Rosie. Yeah, okay. So a lot of basically what I'm gathering is uh, hire people that you can delegate to as much as possible. Hire people that can take the strategy that you want to implement out of your hands. So it's not really about delegation. Set a clear strategy for what you want to do and make yep. sure you've got people that can execute the strategy. Now, you delegate things that you're dealing with. So I'm dealing with a, a big merger between two businesses at the moment, which is sort of in the north of $80 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, the first thing I do is assemble a team, two juniors, me and a, lawyer, a legal partner, yep. get very clear on the process and then execute that process by making all the people who are involved very clear on what we're all going to do. Okay. But then when do you actually, do you ever sit down at, you know, at the times when you do the work as well and you're hands-on in terms of, you know, drafting something? Yeah. Uh, I used to. Yeah, I used to. I love, I mean, I'm, I'm good at writing letters and a piece of advice. I made all my staff learn to touch type when we started Blue Rock. I still give anyone who's um, a poor type of shit when they're typing because I just sit there and I belt letters and emails out pretty quickly. Yeah, there's no magic to it, Michael. It's just um, being able to see a, an issue quickly, working out where you're going to go with it quickly, and then work with the people in the team who are going to help you execute it on it quickly and just get it done. Yeah, okay. I mean, I know focus is a big thing that people struggle with these days because it's so easy to get distracted now uh, with a million pings everywhere and lots of social media and a million things you need to do and you need to write a blog and you need to answer a client and you need to uh, deal with a staff matter. Yeah. Um, I think I find a lot of people say they struggle with focus now. Well, every meeting I go to, and that's the bulk of my life, I have someone with me at all times. Mm -hmm. So it's unusual for me to talk to anyone by myself. And I train those people from the very, from the very get go to pick up the bits that need to be actioned. Yep. We put that in Asana for every single thing we do, like everything we do goes in Asana action points. And then mm -hmm. we just work through the process of making sure it gets churned out the other side. Okay. Do you use anything else? Any other tech? Oh, heaps of tech. Heaps of tech. Okay. Heaps of tech. All sorts of stuff. You'd be, I mean, when I love getting people from accounting firms in to show them what we do at Blue Rock, and I'm really happy to do that. If anyone out there wants to have a coffee with me, I'm always happy to have a chat. Wow. Um, Why do you do that, though? I just enjoy sharing the knowledge. Like, I, I love empowering people to be able to do more. So we're, we're a member of a business called the Virtual Advisor Network with Macquarie Bank. Mm -hmm. And um, they often get firms in to have a look at how Blue Rock do what they do. And I'll just share with them how we do stuff. And um, hopefully people go away with a little bit of knowledge in terms of how they can you know, help advance their own agenda. Uh, I, I love talking about business, like love it. So I could sit there for hours and talk to people about how you do stuff. Who do you consider your competitors now, though? Like the the, the model you've built up? No one. Um, I don't. I don't ever think about competitors. Not out of a position of being arrogant, just because it's not constructive. Okay. There's no merit in me comparing myself to anyone else. A and there's heaps of people that do what we do. There's heaps of people that do what we do and do it better. Mm. Um, there's heaps of firms out there that are bigger than us, faster than us, better than us, but there's no point in me thinking about them. All I worry about is my customer, which is the yep. business owner. How can I help that customer do what they do better? When you were small and you started on your own, you had no rep, um, 
how, what was your client acquisition strategy then? Um, it was around that monthly meeting process. So I differentiated myself in the market by saying to my clients that anyone can do a tax return. Yep. And the cost of that tax return will be the same as what you're paying your accounting firm right now. Mm-hmm. But I'll charge you, and back in those days, it was $1,000 a month. Yep. You'll, you'll meet with me for two hours, and we're going to use a process that I've developed to go through how your business is performing. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to tighten up all the screws in your business to help you make more money. Okay. And, and that um, was your differentiator. So was it mostly referrals then? Uh, and me asking. So when I was, um, I don't know, seven or eight, mum sent me down the road to get my brother from a, um, a mate's house. And I knocked on the front door and the, the my brother's mate was holding a hot dog. And uh, I said to him, I didn't even ask if my brother was there. I just said to him, hey, can I have a hot dog? And uh, he gave me a hot dog. And I was like, this is pretty easy. Just ask someone and they'll uh, usually give you what you ask them if you ask in a nice way. So I'd be at the pub and I'd, I'd meet a, I don't know, I, was, I remember talking to a bouncer at um, a roof shop bar in Melbourne and I found out that he was the owner of a security company. Yeah. And I spent uh, half an hour talking to him about his business. So I said, do you want to come in and have a chat to me about what you're doing in your security company? And they become a client of Blue Rock. Um, and I just, uh, like, if someone has a business, I just ask them, who, who does your advice? Is it any good? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what are they talking to you about? Um, and just help them um, get better at running their business. Yeah, okay. I guess with hindsight, you know, there's always things that you go like, oh, I could have done that better. What, what would you have done differently? Um, yeah, I don't have a lot of a, a lot of reflection on that. that. Like the only thing, if it, it, not so much in a Blue Rock sense, but in a other business sense, I feel like I've... Um, wasted some of the time that I've had in my life growing businesses that I probably shouldn't have. So I love hospitality. Mm. COVID's obviously made me reflect on that. Like it was a, it's a, it's a huge business that employs 500 plus people. Um, But the propeller experience where we invested a few million dollars developing this technology platform, if I was going to do something, it's actually going to sort of help, people I, I probably should have been focused more on technology businesses than on services businesses is that just because of the covid factor that's well, it's, it's, that, it's a big part of it because I'm, I'm i'm worried about my people yeah and i don't get stressed by much but i'm right now i'm anxious about all those people who are sitting at home you know not mm. doing a lot that's it it does sort of weigh on my weigh on my conscience yeah okay understandably um, but I guess would you have done anything different in your career? Yeah, I think so. I've had a great, I've had a great life so far, and well, mate, continue. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted, actually, I'll ask you: if you wanted an accountant, what would you be doing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I don't know if I, if you'd really call me an accountant, to be honest. But um, what would I be doing? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd be doing anything different. I've sort of, I've. I've fallen into this industry and this business, but I do enjoy what I do. So I don't know that it would have, I reckon I would have owned a business in my own right, doing something completely different, maybe an electrician or and something like that. Who knows? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you talked on, uh, you brought up a few times, actually, the the fact that technology will have such a big impact on, auto, you know, on automation and the industry, et cetera. Um, if you were giving advice or I don't know, imagine you're up there at the University of Melbourne or whatever, or Monash, giving yeah. young accountants a speech, what the advice would you be giving them? You know, what, what sort of skills do they need to be developing? Yeah. Uh, the first thing I'd say to those young accountants is learn how to touch top. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Learn how to touch top. That's, yeah. your, that's your primary mode of communication. Um, and obviously yeah. learn how to write well and speak well. Because mm. uh, how you communicate is... Is the first thing that people will judge you on. Um, I guess the next part of it would be to to upskill and how you actually do what you do. So if you think about that discussion we had before about process engineering versus product engineering, human yeah. beings are the same, right? So we we process things the same way 
every time we do it. So if you if you toast your toast in the morning, yep. you turn it to three or four, which I recently found out actually is the amount of minutes of toast for. That's a revelation for some listeners out there. <laughs> I didn't know that either. Yeah, oh, well, it blew my mind. Just as another <laughs> one, on a petrol gauge in your car, there's a little arrow that points to which side the petrol tank's on. I found uh, that out when I was about thirty. When I was about thirty-five. Um, so when you toast toast, you'll toast your toast. The individual will probably go and make a coffee at the same time, get the butter out of the fridge, pull out the veggie mite or whatever, and you'll do that same thing every day the same way, right? So, as a young professional, work out those things that you do every day, and work out how you can streamline them so you do them quicker, mm-hmm. and that way. Um, you become a master of managing time. And that's part of how I can do so much is um, my routine is linear but efficient, like really efficient uh, in terms of how I do everything. Um, I'm and... still trying to figure out how you do things. Like what is it about your routine that makes it efficient? Is it just because it's so repetitive? Oh, or is it... No, it's just I think about it. Like I made um, a bolognese sauce last night um, in the afternoon for dinner. And I was going for a run, and I knew that run was at 4.22. Yeah. I had 10 minutes to get myself ready, so I chopped up onion, garlic, got all the ingredients out on the bench that I knew had to had to go in. And then I went for my run and came back, and I just, in order, I just put them straight into the Le Creuset and cooked what I needed to cook. At the same time, I'm on my headphones having a conversation with a couple of clients. Yeah. Um, and I just make sure that I do it in a way that it all happens quickly so that... Um, when we sat down to dinner that night, it was ready to go and done. Uh, so it's, it's a multitasking slash efficiency equation for me. Um, but it's the same with work, right? Like when you're planning to do a job, most people just dive into doing it. Yep. I spend the time planning how I'm going to do it. Mm. And then I get the team together. So the engagement that I'm working on, it's a big merger uh, for one of my clients, I've drafted out the process of exactly what's going to happen. I'll have a team meeting with the four advisors who are on that engagement Monday, and I'll work out exactly who's responsible for what and how we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see. Right, look, I'm, I'm exactly the same. Like, uh, it, it kind of comes down to that old analogy of if you're going to chop a tree, then you make sure you sharpen your, your axe. Yeah, 100%. So back to you at uni. Yes. Um, so touch typing, number one. Oh, I didn't learn that touch type at uni. <laughs> no, 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 no. But just say, you know, the advice to young accountants, touch typing, communication skills, which, I mean, easy, yeah. easier said it, than done, especially to accountants that are well, usually what, from yeah. English second, as, like English as a second language backgrounds now, yeah. which just invest, invest in learning how to do it. That's what I'd say to them. So mm. learning how to touch type is the same as learning how to structure a good email. So mm-hmm. a lot of organizations like the army has a way of communicating. If, if people want to Google, how does the army write emails? You'll learn something about good communication that you never knew before. Okay. Any particular um, examples? Uh, so they have this thing where they put the, the most important piece of, in their communications as the first line. Yep. And it's got an acronym. I can't remember what it is, but it's like put most important thing first and TP, PM, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, is that what you practice as well? Oh, not really, no. Um, I've got my own structure for how I communicate. But develop, it's like that toast example, develop a way of writing emails that works for you and then don't deviate from the course. Mm-hmm. Make sure that you, so I number every single point I make in an email and I have a call to action. I keep it short and I have a call to action and I try and iterate through things very efficiently. Yep. Um, and I've just develop my own process for how I do it and I train my staff the same way. Do you have a process to make sure nothing slips through the cracks and then you're like, you know, you've got to yeah, do, yeah, do, use a to-do list? Like what, what, what's it? Do you have a cal- Do you live off your calendar? A, yeah, a, a signer board. So okay. all of our action points for clients go in our signer board with a person delegated and a timeline it has to be done by. Let's say you're on the phone with a client, you're chopping up your onions or whatever and then like, you know, he says or you say, look, I'll get back to you with A, B and C. How do you make yeah. sure you remember to get back to me with A, B, and C. Email. So I'll, okay. I'll email the person who's helping me. So that's a good example because the conversation I had last night with a client 
was around the due diligence for the merger. Mm-hmm. I then emailed Tegan, who's the woman helping me with the matter on my accounting side and gave her a list of everything we need to address. Yep. I CC'd the legal partner from Blue Rock Law who's going to do all the, the share purchase agreement, the merger documents and the tax advice. And then um, that goes into the system. So our systems can pick up emails and drop them into Asana automatically for us. Wow. Okay. Understand. Um, you're all good? I'm good. Yeah. No, okay. no problem. <laughs> I've been getting uh, multiple texts from people or whatever for something, but that's fine. Um, back to sort of like young accountants. So communication skills, what, what, what else? What would be the other big thing for them to... Well, work out what you want to do. So I started in audit. Oh, you started in audit first and then yeah. you moved to tax. Okay. I didn't want to do audit. <laughs> Why? Um, uh, it just wasn't for me. Like I was okay. auditing like Alcoa, I remember, which was an uh, aluminium minor um yeah. yeah it wasn't like literally green pen ticking stuff with green pens um red pens like it was horrible um that's so interesting because like i could never do tax returns all day long at a junior level like i i love the work that you do because that, that's also what comes naturally to me like the business advisory aspect and, and business yeah um but i couldn't do tax returns all day and you know all day yeah. in all day out kind of thing what i explain to people about yeah you, particularly people who are starting out is you have to do that stuff to get to my level so i talk a lot with my graduates about the karate kid of all things i'll say watch the movie and you'll understand a lot more about what you're about to go through because in that movie daniel son had to paint the fence and wax the floor yep. and he couldn't understand why and it was so he could learn the fundamentals of being a good advisor mm. so i can talk to um you know, Division 152, which is the CGT small business concessions, as easily as I can talk to Division 7A, which is the damn dividend rules, as easily as I can talk to the Corporations Act and how um, Section 259P works. And yep. if I hadn't done all of the hard work around reading legislation, becoming comfortable with the Corporations Act, working out our members' meetings, work, uh, I couldn't actually advise. So one thing that I've always been not the biggest fan of is partners who are advising clients who aren't technically strong Mm -hmm. because it's, you can't sit there and have a conversation with someone about a complex matter without having the requisite paint the fence, you know, wax the floor knowledge to actually know when you don't know something. So how do you guys stay up to date with that though? Like, are you still doing, yeah, all, absolutely. I, I, go to, I go to tax, tax seminars every. We have internal tax seminars that are done by yeah. um, Web Martin or whatever they're called these days. Yeah. Um, we have uh, a lot of literature that gets emailed out to us from our technical practice area within Blue Rock. Um, I, I also subscribe to a lot of law firms have great technical resources that I subscribe to that let mm-hmm. they email you the latest updates on you know insolvency law or whatever it might be. Um, the other thing that I always say that's nice about my position now is you get to read the letters for your clients that other people have written. Mm-hmm. So you can shortcut to the answer. Whereas in the old days, you had to actually do the work yourself and write that letter yourself. Now I just get to read all those letters myself and I learn from that almost in an unfair way. Um, so you learn about, you know, uh, Division 328 and all those cool rules and um, you don't actually have to do any of the work to get there. Makes sense. Um, anything else for the young accountant? Like you talked about, you know, the karate kid example. Well, what I was going to say is just find out what you want to do because if you yep. want to be an auditor, become a specialist in that area. If you want to become a tax advisor, become a specialist in that area. If you want to be a generalist, um, then work out what's required to become a generalist and then focus on that area. It's hard so, to know when you're coming out of uni, you've never done audit or tax or anything. You just kind of get, you know. Correct. No, it is hard to know. You just get thrown in. You sort of end up yeah. where you end up. No, I agree with that. So it's like, how do you feel? I mean, a lot of them ask me, it's like, how am I meant to know whether I like tax or what? I've never done either of them. Well, do them and see how you go. Yeah. Uh, you're and then ask for a transfer people. if it doesn't work out. I reckon a lot of it's to do with uh, working with people you like. Mm. So you might not actually like audit, but you might really like the people you work with. So you stick at it till you're good at it. Sometimes the the vertical can define who you are as opposed to you defining what vertical you're in 
Mm -hmm. It's true. Because yeah, I think it's just about being open to opportunities and, you know, a yeah, bit of self-reflection as well. Yeah, 100%. Um, still trying to... So the petrol gauge thing. Yeah. Tell me more about that. It's on the... So when you, you know when you're looking at your... At whether you empty or full? Yeah. On that dial, you'll see a little triangle. Okay. That, tri that triangle points to whichever side your petrol tank is on. There's a little... And every car has a little triangle there. Every car has one. So okay, you know, I'm going to look if, at it. If you're in a new car, and even when you're driving a car, like I don't, I, I'm one of these people that can't tell their left from their right. So I actually hold my hand up and go L for left and then backward L for right. So I go to the petrol station, and when I pull into the petrol station, I have a look at my petrol gauge, see the arrow, and go, that's the side it's on. <laughs> what do you mean you can't tell the difference when you're left and you're right? So there's a percentage of the population that cannot tell the left their left hand side from their right hand side and it's how a do you drive then? it's a condition um well you, you you drive from muscle memory so when you're driving so if someone says to me in an area that i've never been in before i turn left mm. i'll always say to them your left or my left <laughs> and and that, and then they'll usually say over here and they'll wave to whichever side they want me to go to wow if you google okay. it you'll 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 see what i mean there's lots i've of never heard there. of that what's that what? called oh i've got no idea okay in uh, in Zoolander, there's there's an Ambi Turner, which is a fellow that can only turn one way. <laughs> but I don't know what it's called that condition. But I have it. My sister has it. I'm sure lots of listeners will have it. I mean, wow, amazing! I've, I've learned three things today. Well, that's good in an hour. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you. I guess we, we talked about the the Blue Rock thirty thirty plan, yes. um, which is thirty officers, thirty mil. What's what's the strategy behind that to you know in terms of how you want to execute it and then also what's the big vision? Yeah, uh, so it's re it's really simple. That... Well, I think it's really simple. We're going to find predominantly accounting firms around the world, starting with Australia, that yep. that might have three or four million dollars worth of revenue. We're going to partner with them under an equity model where Blue Rock Thirty Thirty own 60% of that firm and the other 40% is owned by the people who are running it. Oh, will that still be under EIA or is yep. Blue Rock 3030 a separate entity? No, nah, EIA owns Blue Rock 3030 or yep. part of it. Um, we're going to encourage the people who sell their 60% to invest some money in EIA so we're aligned. Mm -hmm. And then EIA through Blue Rock 3030 is going to invest in professional services tech. So we've got a, a list of 25 products in Blue Rock 3030 that we're going to build that tax planning one is an example. We're going to build a tool that automates tax planning. Mm -hmm. We're going to build a tool that automates estate planning or continue to develop a tool we've already built. And there's a list of um, products that we're going to sell to our clients that are required either by law or by need. Um, and then we're going to take that accounting firm, that three or $4 million accounting firm, we're going to build a multidisciplinary model around them mm -hmm. under the Blue Rock banner. We're going to plug in all of the things that we do at Blue Rock that helps them scale revenue. And then we're going to plug in technology, which will help automate how they actually execute on the work. Okay. Um, so we've started that process already by setting up a new office in Melbourne with about $3 million worth of accounting fees, just carved yep. off from the old one. And we'll grow that to 30 mil over the next three or four years. So another one in, sorry, did you say another one in Melbourne? Yeah, we'll probably do five or six in Melbourne, I reckon, by the time we're okay. finished. Like there's there's already interest from other people who I know that are struggling to grow. And is it all in the Blue Rock branding or will you, each yeah, one have no, Blue Rock branding. So you'll see, I mean, the idea is to build autonomous offices where they, where they effectively run their own race just with our help. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't want to do is disenfranchise the people who are running each office. The other thing that happens is you get to a point from an equity model perspective with an existing practice where there's nowhere for people to go. So by having new a new way of doing things, you give the people coming through a new opportunity as well. Is it, what, what's and then how do you deal with the, I guess cannibalism? Well, you don't. You 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 accept the fact that competition will always exist. Yep. You accept the fact that smart people will work out how to get to the right result for their clients and for their community. Mm -hmm. And you accept the fact that there's an unlimited amount of work out there. Okay. Genuinely unlimited. Like if you think about how many accounting firms there are in Australia, and you think about the amount of revenue they're looking after, mm -hmm. it's a it's an infinite volume of work. What's the benefit of doing it multi-office 
approach in Melbourne versus just building out and having? Well, I'll, get, I'll give you a great example. So r- right now, Blue Rock 3030 owns 100% of our office in Melbourne. Yep. And then Blue Rock 3030 is owned by EIA and by the directors of Blue Rock. Mm-hmm. We're going to sell down equity in 414 to the other people in the in the business so they can become part of the equity structure. Mm-hmm. With 505, which is a new office we're setting up, we're going to sell equity down to the new people running that office. So you effectively have these small offices that have three or four million bucks worth of revenue. We'll help them get to 30 million quickly and we'll let people invest 40 up to 40% of the equity in those new offices. So the benefit is twofold. One is autonomy to run your own race and not be governed by the man, so to speak, because that's what happens as firms become mature. And the second benefit is you give everyone who's running that office the opportunity to invest in the equity structure, but also invest in the EIA equity structure. So you get sort of two bites of the cherry. That way the EIA investment covers every Blue Rock office mm-hmm. and the 40% investment in the subsidiary Blue Rock office is owned directly by the people running it. Okay. And then is that a, like the people that would be joining you, um, the three, four million, which is probably what, four or five partners as well. Is that partly a succession plan for them? Or is it usually young partners that are? I'm probably, yeah, it's a, mix, it's a mixture. Like I'm talking to one firm that does have two old partners and two young partners and the two young partners is success, succession plan. Yep. Um, but there's no real, I mean, everyone's going to be different, right? So we'll, we'll just have mm. a conversation and see where they land. Um, How, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges in that? Like replication of culture. So taking that belief system of no judgment, look after, look after each other. And there's plenty of pie for everyone Mm. and building that across, you know, 30 offices across the world. The only way we'll actually be able to do it, Michael, is by having a product led technology solution. You can't, you can't, every accounting, accounting firm in Australia does year-end compliance very similarly yep. but with enough variation that it's not exactly the same mm-hmm. we'll automate it and that do you way, find has your culture changed though like if you if you look well, it does as you get bigger culture. yeah definitely so yeah. that's part of what's been lost is back in the day when there were 50 people we like we were going to fiji for firm retreats and mm. new caledonia for firm retreats and having the time of our lives at 200 close to 250 people today um there's a massive disconnect between you know, I used to know every single person in the business and, and know a lot about them. These days, I'm lucky to remember their names. And that's not a function of not wanting to. It's a function of size. So how do you maintain a certain culture? Or even Well, by having, by exactly this strategy. So I, I believe we can do $30 million with about 100 people once we have a fully automated solution. Wow. Okay. So every office will be autonomous. It won't be like Grant Thornton where it's a, a national uh, a national firm and every Blue Rock office will be its own Blue Rock office and it, they'll do whatever they want mm-hmm. just using Blue Rock IP to help them do more. So if they want to go on a firm retreat to Las Vegas, they can. Okay. Even though they still only have 40% equity though. Well, this is the thing, right? So if you own a hundred percent of a business that's capped out at 3 million, are you better off owning that? Or are you better off owning 40% of a business that's turning over 30 million? Yep. And if Blue Rock pays you, I don't know, call it $3 million for that 60%, and you put a million into EIA, and that business is worth $5 billion in 10 years, mm-hmm. your million dollars in EIA could be worth $50 million. Yep. So that's the model. And um, it's it has nothing to do with, I mean, this comes back to that whole point about ownership, right, and control. So I personally don't own a controlling stake in any business I run. And I'm comfortable with that because it's not, I'm not actually in it to try and control people. I'm in it to grow the opportunity for all of us. Hmm. Uh, it's a very different way of thinking. And most accountants will really struggle with it. I believe so. Yeah. Like with the ones that, said. the ones that don't, they'll be the new, that'll be the new generation of, of blue rockers. that'll effectively be doing things very differently to help the current batch of, uh, professionals look at the world it'll be interesting to see we could fall flat in our face um but i'm, I'm excited crack. yeah that'll be yeah I think it it sounds like we've a really done, exciting journey we've done all right so far so if nothing else we've we've had a good run thus far so you've got one firm signed up in melbourne already that will be... oh no that was so what what part of the model is to we so we say carve off 10 and start again so when you get to 30 mil 
yep. you have the ability to carve off a small amount of revenue and start again. So that's what Fallout yep. 4 is doing, carving off $3 million to start again. Okay. Um, but we do have uh, two or three firms that we're working with right now that are really interested in the model and want to, and want to talk about taking it forward. And then who will be responsible for building all the kind of periphery services around yeah, so we have within blue rock 3030 um we have a team of people who are full stack tech developers yep. graphic designers ux ui experts um, i've just hired a an engineer from nestle uh, who worked at nestle for 20 years in senior management um who's a very entrepreneurial creative mm -hmm. person and uh we're going to build we're going to build stuff that doesn't exist but that, that's the tech bit. But what about like the law, the digital marketing, the financial planning businesses that are bolted onto that accounting practice? Is that so, going to go back to the mothership or is that each one will have its own nah, bolt? -on? Each one will have its own course. The core service offering will be law, accounting, wealth, finance, and digital automation. They're the, the, the five pillars. Yep. Um, it might not be the case where the general insurance division, a bookkeeping division, that'll be a case by case. Okay. Will it be their responsibility, those three or four partners? Uh, Blurock 3030, no, no, no. no. Blurock 3030 will be, our mandate will be to go in there and help them hire the people. Yep. We've got a, a different equity structure to get those people aligned, mm -hmm. um, which is another conversation almost in itself. <laughs> um, and then we'll plug in all of our collateral. Like we have pretty cool systems that um, that help everyone understand how we do things yep. already. And we'll just, we'll just expand those. Okay. Is there, like, if you had to look at culture, because culture is such a subjective term, like, do you have particular thoughts about it in terms of this is the culture that I have, or is of it course. just the caring aspect that you refer to? A hundred percent we do. So in the vision breakfast, which is in that presentation that you would have seen on Prezi, I talk a lot about culture and how culture equals behavior. Um, yep. We have a belief system around no judgment. We don't judge people as you would expect you shouldn't around mm. race, religion, all yep. that good stuff uh even people who are different from us you just have to be respectful of the differences yep smart people will work it out so we believe that we shouldn't be too heavily involved in letting people work out how they're going to do stuff mm -hmm. um and importantly doing things you love with people you care about is you know that it's almost the the analogy i use in my presentation is that field of dreams analogy if you build it they will come mm -hmm. and it's all about building a great ecosystem to excel and then the rest will you know it'll sort itself out okay is there is there anything else that you like you know that you believe in that others think you're i don't know crazy or um yeah well i'm a big advocate of uh like i, I think as you and i had a brief chat about earlier before this podcast um i'm not a massive fan of the cult of personality so I really respect people that have done great things and, and you can do great things in, um, in film and television. Um, but I do worry as a society that we, we pay too much attention to the cult of personality. So one of my favorite people and someone who I greatly respect is Arnold Schwarzenegger yep. and Grant Ralston, who, um, started Blue Rock with me back in the day. He's a massive fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger and would like go to his seminars and stuff. So I lots of learn about him through Grant. And Arnold Schwarzenegger started out as a bodybuilder. It's fable. We, we all know the story. Yeah. But if you read his book, Total Recall, um, which is an awesome read, you learn about his journey from bodybuilding into acting into being the governor of California, seventh largest economy in the world. And also um, his, you know, he was he had a big hand in studying the Special Olympics because he was married to one of the Kennedys. Um, and that, that was something that, you know, will be his legacy forever. So I look at that sort of, um, that sort of celebrity, and I go, he's he's an agent for change, and has done a lot of great things. But then I look at someone like um, Kim Kardashian as a as a complete polar opposite, and I have no respect. And and that and she might be lovely, and she might be a wonderful human being. I don't know. I don't pay a lot of attention to what she's done, but mm. I don't think she's adding value in my, in my mind anyway. Um, but I mean, when we think about Blue Rock, like your the name Blue Rock, I think comes from your. Love of the of a hey, Dwayne Johnson yeah. and the Rock people's, and the... the people's elbow, absolutely. <laughs> I love. I, I used to love wrestling as a kid. Okay. Um, and I love the Rock before he was famous. Okay, and um, then Carlton as well. 
Ah, and the Blues. I'm a, I've always been a big Carlton supporter. Um, and the, the, the reason I bring that up is like, I've always felt, uh, especially in Australia, it's like this whole uh, c- celebrity status of and admiration of footy stars or even sports people. They shouldn't be our role models. I've never, correct. I've never looked at them as role models because well, they, if, if they're doing positive things, I think they can. If be role they models. are, but yeah, like I don't, yeah. I don't celebrate Carlton because of you know how how good the footy players are. I just love. I love sport. I love watching the AFL. I love footy. Um, Carlton's my team. Um, yep. So there's not. I'm not doing it because I, I admire. I don't know Jacob Weedering or <laughs> you know any of these guys. It's not. That's not the reason I love Carlton. Um, and Dwayne the Rock Johnson, like he was a he was a ripping good wrestler. He was. I used to like love a, watching him as well. An, an entertainer. <laughs> um, and he's a great actor as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well. He was a great actor. I'm not sure if he is anymore, but <laughs> he um, he was a, he 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 had some awesome movies back what's, in the day. What's your end game, or I guess legacy? Uh, I don't have an end game. Um, yeah, I don't have. I'm not that interested in leaving a legacy or building huge personal wealth. That's not my. It's not my objective. I just want to live each day as well as I can and spend time with the people I care about. Uh, and live a good life. So, what what does a good life look like to you? Spending time, yeah, spending time with the people you care about every yeah. day. So that's been the hardest bit about lockdown is I've been removed from that world where I can actually see my friends, mm-hmm. same as everyone. And that's the only bit about it that's impacting me is um, I look back on the last two years and I sort of wonder whether um, we've sort of missed out on two years of our lives in some respects. Been good for the family, like spending time with yeah. my kids and my wife's been awesome, but other, other than that, it's been pretty tricky. With the thirty thirty plan, wouldn't you be out and about traveling all over the world? Trying right. to, uh, yeah, how would that how would that work with family and friends? Um, I just, I would just do it. <laughs> I, was gonna... I don't know, like, I, I don't think about that, to be honest. Okay. If I I'm just thinking about, from the balance perspective, yeah. If I, no, I don't worry about balance either. If I thought about that stuff, nothing would happen. Okay. So I don't, yeah, I don't plan my life i don't believe in work-life balance i don't believe in work-life integration i don't believe in any of that what i would call bullshit i just believe in like if i could go mountain biking today i would mm-hmm. um i'll go i'll go for a run with my boys later which will be nice um i won't see any of my friends because i can't okay um, so when you say you don't believe like in work-life balance or any of that bullshit what does that mean well i think just think it's a conversation that people love to have because it makes them feel good about talking about something that means nothing <laughs> do something you love doing and the, you, you won't ever have to worry about whether it's work-life balance or not. Like I love what I do. I love talking to people about business. I love spending hmm. time with my friends. Um, but if, you, if you're a career kind of oriented or workaholic, a lot of them, you know, like the guys that I know in law firms or accounting partners, they don't see their friends or their family that much just because they're always working. Yeah, I find that an odd, yeah, I find that an odd life. My sisters, two of my sisters are lawyers and they've, lived a bit of that life over the journey and I don't know it's just not for me yeah, and okay. not for the people I work with either in my opinion because I think you've got the balance as you said because you prioritize it it just automatically kind of happens because of where your priorities lie yeah I just I think Michael I just do what I do without thinking about it too hard <laughs> I don't overthink it <laughs> but you do plan things before you start doing them definitely <laughs> well I don't want to waste time so yeah <laughs> God, it's very frustrating when you're working on something that's that's not going the way you want it because you haven't actually thought about how you want it to end. Hmm. Hmm. I've got some rapid fire questions for you to finish up on. Sure. What's your favorite quote? Uh, say no to the naysayers. <laughs> okay. Why is that so, your favorite quote? Oh, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. So he's got if you if you if you YouTube Arnold's rules for life, he's got a few of them. But one of them is to say no to the naysayers. To say no to people that tell you no. Um, and I, you know, I, I love that. I love saying "say no to the naysayers." That's how he says it. <laughs> and, uh, it resonates with me because I hate negative people, and I can't abide by people that can't find a way to do something. Okay. So, yeah. what have you read, watched, or learned recently that's had the most impact on you? Recently, I've got three. I guess three books that I recently or. Things that yeah, like things that you loved, books. Yeah, the most I've got three, 
three things that have influenced me greatly. One's managing the professional services firm by David Meister. Yep. Uh, I bought a I bought a copy of that for every single person in Blue Rock when we started. Mm-hmm. Another one is uh, First Break All the Rules, um, The Secret to Great Managers' Success by Marcus Buckingham. Um, those two books probably set me on the course for that, you know, that pillar around the business model. What's the business model that works in your organisation? Yep. Uh, and then in Total Recall by Alan Schwarzenegger would be more of a, a like, I, I love um, non-fiction stories about business owners or successful people. So, uh, you know, there's the one about Steve Jobs, which is really interesting. There's the one about um, Amazon and um, how Amazon was created. I think that's another interesting book. The Every- I think it's called The Everything Store, which mm-hmm. I'm reading. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, have you bought anything recently, like physical items that you know made your life better, easier? You're like, wow. Um, oh, I'll tell you what I did buy. I'll tell you what I did buy. This will be a revelation for your listeners. I bought this thing called a mesh wireless network. Okay. From JB Hi-Fi, called it an Orbi. It's a Netgear product, and there's you buy little pods and you put them around your house, and you plug one into the router in your house. And it, my internet, no word of a lie, went from 30 megabits per second upstairs in my study to 102 megabits per second with the Orbi. Um, so really, really sped up everything. But then you still said you have to use your phone for everything. Well, when I'm on Zoom. I don't think it's the internet quality. I think it's to do with the quality of the technology. So Zoom just drops out every now and then. Interestingly, on this platform we're using Squadcast, we haven't had any yeah, no, it's um, issues. But I, I also think it's because there's, I mean, my guess would be on Squadcast, the servers are hosting maybe 1,000 people in Australia right now. Yeah. Zoom would be <laughs> hosting more. six or seven million people right now. So yeah. That's why I reckon the internet quality drops out. It's nothing to do with the actual NBN or yeah, okay. the internet. It's to do with the amount of users on it. Um, who would you want to have a drink with the most in the world, past or present? Um, yeah, probably Nelson Mandela. I reckon. Like um, his his story, the long walk to freedom, uh, was very inspirational, and uh, he would have been someone I'd love to have met. Even some of even some of those old school conquerors like Alexander the Great. Peter the Great, Caesar, like I'd love to sort of get into their head and understand how they actually synthesized, you know, taking over the known world. Hmm. Would you ask him, what would you ask Nelson or Alexander the Great? Well, Nelson Mandela, like I, 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 I'd like to understand how he spent, I think it was 26 years in a prison in South Africa. Some crazy amount, yeah. How did he actually get through that? Because to me... For someone who's sort of, I imagine, would be really inspirational in terms of how they think about life, like it, it would just be soul destroying to be locked in a cell every day. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'd ask him. How did he get through it all? Like, what did he do to. Have you um, read Viktor Frankl's book? No. No? Um, what was it called? The Meaning, the Meaning of Life from Memory? Yeah, no, I haven't read it. Um, about there's a concentration camp survivor, so that's uh, one of. Okay. Um, I yeah, read. it's it's famous. Like it's one of those books that also gets highly, highly recommended. Yeah, by, yeah, um, okay. Sorry, I, man, I, search I, for, I, man, search for meaning. Apologies. Man, search for meaning. Yeah, and it basically talks about why some people survived and some people didn't, and it, it all came down to just how they oh. internalized the world and you know the hope factor, basically. And they dealt with it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So I just kind of, you know, resonated with what you were saying about Nelson Mandela, how he did it. I would imagine probably something to do with how Victor viewed the world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pete, it's been an absolute pleasure. I know you've got uh, a meeting. Been great. Thank thanks you so for, much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. And uh, no doubt I'm sure we'll talk again. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like our podcast and share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is you hang out so more people can benefit from these speakers. Also, please subscribe on our website so you get all of our latest episodes. And if there's anything else I can help you with or you have speakers you'd love to hear from or some feedback about the current episode, please feel free to send an email to michael at recruitmentexpert.com.au. Until then, take care 
and I look forward to connecting with you in the future.